a set is just a collection of things. They don't need, in the case of any particular set, to be things of the same sort, and they don't need to be assembled together at a particular place and time, because so far as sets are concerned, it's what's in them that counts. It's their members, or, as we sometimes say, their elements that are the key. And we reflect this simple idea in what we call the axiom of extensionality. And by the axiom of extensionality, a set is simply defined by its members. And that is to say, if we have a set X and a set Y, then X and Y are the same set, that is to say, X equals Y, just if they contain the same members. Now, I actually prefer to express that in a slightly different way. I'm going to suggest that they are the same set just if every member of one is a member of the other. And the reason I'm going to express it that way is that we are going to find a place for a set or the set which contains no members whatsoever. Now, why do I say the set singular? Well, because if we have two empty sets, then there is nothing in one which is not in the other. And so by this axiom of extensionality, as I've just articulated it, those two empty sets are the same set. And so far as the empty set is concerned, we sometimes write that, we sometimes term it the null set, and it's generally written like that, that is to say a circle with a diagonal line through it. Now let's suppose we have a set, let's call it set A, and that is the set of all odd numbers less than 10. Now, we would generally write that, we will often write that in curly brackets. We will say the members of the set are 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. That is to say, again, all odd numbers less than 10. A is also equal to a set written like this. 3, 7, 1, 9, 5. Because again, it's what's in the set that counts. The set is defined by its members rather than the order in which they're written. Now let's suppose we have another set. Let's call it the set C. And let's suppose that is the set containing just the planet Venus. Well, Venus is sometimes known, uh, some of you might recall Quine having used this example as the evening star. So that set is equal to the set containing the evening, I'm going to abbreviate here, star. And Venus is also sometimes known as the morning star. So, that again holds. Now note that the set containing the word Venus is of course not equal to the set, is not the same set as the set containing the words evening star. And neither of those sets are the same set as that containing the evening star. Because this set contains just one member, has just one member, that is to say the word Venus, that's why we've included it within these marks. This set also contains one member. That member is the two words, evening star, here abbreviated. And this set contains one member, which is the object which is denoted by the words evening star, which is the evening star itself, in other words, Venus.
Now, I said we'll often rate sets by enclosing their members within curly brackets, or the names of their members within curly brackets, and that is simple enough for finite sets with relatively few members. So, as I defined it earlier, the set A, uh, comprising all of the odd numbers less than 10, can be straightforwardly written by simply enumerating the members within these curly brackets. For larger sets, non-finite sets, very large sets, that's not going to be practical. Sometimes we can use suggestive marks in the case of the set of natural numbers, that is zero and the positive integers. We might write the set like this, including the first few members within curly brackets, and then use these dots suggestively to convey the continuation. Another way of defining a set with a large number of members, or a non-finite number of members, is to write it by reference to rule for determining what is in the set and what is not in the set. So in the case of the set of natural numbers, we might define that or describe that as being the set of all things x, such that x is a natural number. So generally we would say the set x, we might define it as being the set of all things x, such that, and then set out the rule for determining what is in the set and what is not in the set. Now let's move on to a matter of terminology. A set with just one member is termed a singleton. Recall that I suggested that the set with no members is sometimes termed the empty set or the null set. Well, the set with just one member, any set with just one member, is termed a singleton. And now a definition. If we have two sets, x and y, and if each member of x is also a member of y, then x is said to be a subset of y. And we write that using this u-type symbol on its side with a line underneath it. So x in this case is a subset here x is a subset of y. That is to say, again, to repeat, that every member of x is also a member of y. And sometimes we'll write that sign the other way around. In this case, again, uh, y is what we call a superset of x. If x is a subset of y, then y is a superset of x. x is a subset of y, just reversing the order of the terms. Now, in the event that y contains all of the members of x, which is to say that x is a subset of y, and, moreover, y contains some things which are not in x, then x is said to be a proper subset of y. And we write that using the same sort of sign, but without the, the line, the equals part, as it were, of the sign um, for a subset. So in this case, x is a proper subset of y, and by the same token as uh, previously, we can reverse the order of the terms. Um, x is a proper subset of y. That means that everything in x is in y, but y has some other things besides. And again, as uh, you'll be familiar with this device, this subset sign with a line through it simply signifies in this case, where we have x preceding the sign and y after it, that x is not a proper subset of y, a familiar device. And by the definition of a subset, if x is a subset of y and moreover y is a subset of x, then, because by the first of these two conditions, everything in x is in y, and since by the second everything in y is in x, then of course x equals y, because there is nothing in the one which is not in the other. And so, by the axiom of extensionality, they are the same set. Now we come to some definitions. 
we describe the union of two sets, let's suppose those sets to be x and y, as the set of all things which are either in x or in y or in both. And we write the union of two sets using this u-type symbol, this broad u-type symbol that we have here. So x, this symbol y, simply means x union y, the set of all things which are either in x or in y or in both. The intersection of two sets, x and y, is the set of all things which are in both x and y. And we write that x with this inverted union sign y. So that is a set and x intersection y is a set and it is the set more specifically of things which are both in x and in y. So we might define uh, the set, which is the union of two others, as being the set of all x, such that x is a member of x, uh, or x is a member of y. And this e-type sign is the membership symbol. And by the same token, x intersection y is the set of all things little x such that little x is a member of x and little x is a member of y. So let's just give some examples. If a is the set comprising the things a1, a2, a3, and a4, and b is the set comprising a1, a2, a5, and a6, then a union b is the set of all of those things which are either in a or in b or both, which is to say a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6, because of course a1 and a2 occur in both of those sets, but we don't write them twice, they're the same object. So A union B is the set of all of those elements, and A intersect B is the set of all things which are in both, and just by scanning the four members in of each of these sets we see that only A1 and A2 occur in both. So A intersect B is the set comprising just the elements A1 and A2. Now for some notation. In the case of large strings of unions, the unions of large numbers of sets, uh, x1, x2, up to x sub n, for example, we might use some familiar type devices uh, to write those more simply, uh, being the union from i equal 1 to n of x sub i. It's the union of all of the x sub i's for each i equal to 1 to n. Or we might write it union i equals 1 through n of x sub i, or union of uh, the i members of the set, for all i members of the set, 1 through n of x sub i. I. Just a convenient form of notation for writing unions or indeed intersections, as we see here, where those unions or intersections are of a large number of sets. Now let's define another set, another operation on sets. If x and y are any sets, then y subtracted from x is the set of all things which are in x and not in y. And we write that x with this minus sign y. So it's the set x, all of those things in x, with all of those things in y taken out. And we might say under those circumstances that x subtract y is a set of all things x, such that x, small x, is a member of the set x, and small x is not a member of y.